Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. While many books, articles, and social media posts offer advice on adulting in our daily lives, there's only one resource to help us become spiritually mature believers, God's Word. This study in the book of James with Pastor Skip will encourage you to embrace discipline and difficulty to glorify God and demonstrate your faith to others. Can you imagine anybody saying no to that? Want prayer? You probably have seen these signs uh, from time to time on the weekend when you come. When you come to church on Sunday, uh, we begin every service with prayer or praise. We typically regard prayer as a Sunday activity. Not you, but most people, when you think of prayer, they think, oh yeah, that's what we do on Sundays. When I go to church, we open in prayer. And... um, we close in prayer. But of course, the Bible says, pray without ceasing, or pray on every occasion, or if you would like, pray every day. There was a woman who did pray every day. She had a little apartment, and she was a strong believer, and she would voice her prayers out loud. Her neighbor was an atheist, and could overhear her in her daily devotions. It drove her nuts. So when she would be praying for something, the atheist would hear it and shout back at the top of her lungs, there is no God. But that didn't deter the Christian lady from being devout and praying every single day out loud. One day she was in dire need of groceries. She prayed out loud for groceries, asked God to provide The atheist, overhearing her, smiled and said, I'll fix her. She, the atheist, went to the store, bought a bunch of groceries, placed them on the front porch of the believer, knocked on the door, and hid in the bushes to see what would happen. The believer came out. She saw the groceries. She understandably got excited, raised her voice to heaven and said, God, thank you. I knew you would provide and praise the Lord. And just then the atheist jumps out of the bushes and says, you foolish old lady, God didn't buy you those groceries, I bought you those groceries. Well, then the believer started shouting even louder and jumping up even higher and more praise the Lord's, thank you Jesus, hallelujahs. The atheist sort of um, bemused at that, said, why does that excite you? And the believer said to the atheist, I knew that God would provide my groceries. I just didn't know he would make the devil pay for it. (laughs) Prayer is not just for Sundays. Prayer is for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's something that we we do every day. So uh, answer the question. Do you want prayer? Yes. Yes. Now... uh, Some people will, when it comes to prayer, a lot of people don't like the idea that we, uh, whenever we, the subject of prayer comes up, they get nervous. Oh, it's one of those prayer sermons again. And uh, that's because we all instinctively know this is an area we can grow in. We need to grow in. And when prayer comes up, we, we might even flag the notion with several excuses like, Look, I'd like to do that. You don't understand my schedule. I just don't have enough time to develop a quality, meaningful, lengthy prayer life. I get that. I understand the pressures we face as a modern society. I would simply ask you back a series of questions. Do you have enough time to binge watch a series on Netflix? Do you have enough time to go get a good workout at the gym? Do you have time to go play a round of golf? Do you have time to go shopping? Do you have time to practice a musical instrument? Do you have time to look at messages on Instagram, etc., etc.? The average person spends 40 minutes a day on the phone, that is, talking in conversations on the phone. The average person spends four hours and 37 minutes looking at the screen of their phone. 
Isn't that amazing? Four hours, 37 minutes, average person. We spend, the average person, one hour a day in the bathroom, three hours a day watching television, one hour a day eating and drinking. The average Christian will spend less than 10 minutes a day in prayer. And that's even being generous. According to the Barna Research Institute, they say one minute. One minute per day. For years, uh, my wife and I had a little magnet on our dishwasher, and it was a picture of Billy Graham, and it was the side profile of Billy. It was sort of a famous photograph, and he was praying, and it showed his side profile and had one word on the magnet, pray, exclamation point, pray. So every day we'd walk by that with that reminder, pray, pray, pray. And I think that's such a fitting thing from his life because when he was older, he was being interviewed and they said, Dr. Graham, if you could do it all over again, would you change anything about your life? He said, yes, I would study the Bible more and I would have prayed more. I would have said yes less to speaking engagements. I would have traveled less. I would have spent more time in the Word and in prayer. There's a man who did spend his life and ministry preaching the Word and, of course, praying for people. Now, as uh, we begin James chapter 5 this morning, I hope you have a Bible with you. It's important to do that whenever we study the Bible, have a Bible actually with you to study. Uh, James chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse... 13, I just want to make an announcement. I do not want to guilt you into praying. I do want to guide you into praying. So much so that prayer becomes just the natural, instinctive response to everything in life. In everything, give thanks. Pray without ceasing. It just becomes a natural part of us. Most of us do struggle in this area. But I don't think prayer should ever be something that creates anxiety. Oh, here it is, prayer sermon. Oh, I feel so anxious. <laughs> prayer was meant to relieve anxiety, not create anxiety. You know the passage, Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guide or keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, James has already said a lot in his letter about the speech that we use, words that we use, the tongue in particular, and how that the tongue can destroy. He's already talked about the lowest use of the tongue, cursing men, chapter 3, complaining, chapter 5, now, James talks about the highest use of the tongue, and that is prayer and praise. And we're going to look at verse 13 to verse 16. The whole last section of this uh, little letter is about prayer. We're going to take it in two uh, sessions. We're going to look at the first uh, few verses of this, James chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 16. Here's what I'd like to do with you. I want to give you five specific conditions of life that require prayer. When should you pray? Let me give you the times when you should pray. Number one, pray when you're suffering. Pray when you're suffering. Look at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Question mark, rhetorical question. Let him pray. Now let's answer the question. You ready? Ready to answer the question? I'm going to ask the question, you're going to answer it. Is anyone among you suffering? It's always a yes. It's always a yes in every congregation at any given time. There's always people among us who are suffering because suffering is a fact of life. Physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering. It's all a normal part of life. Remember in James chapter 1, he said, he used the category, various trials. Something can fit in that category somewhere. Various trials. We all experience them. A little context, however, just so you understand James in his writing. James 
is writing specifically to scattered Jewish believers. They um, were scattered because they were fleeing persecution. Back in the book of Acts, in chapter 8, it says, A great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and the believers were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Well, that scattering brought them to new locations, including beyond Judea and Samaria, to Asia Minor. And it is believed that James is writing this letter to several Jewish Christian congregations throughout Asia Minor Minor, who are suffering persecution. They were scattered. And even in their new locations, they are experiencing suffering and persecution for two reasons. Number one, because they are Jewish. Number two, because they are Christians. And the pagan world did not like either of those two groups very well. And to be a Jewish Christian in those days was particularly threatening. We cannot avoid suffering. It's a fact of life. We've said it on so many occasions. We can't avoid it because we cannot avoid bumping into the evil of a fallen world. And even if we could somehow manage to not ever get involved or see or touch the evil in a fallen world, we still have a problem us. We're part of the fallen world. We are fallen people. And uh, wherever you go, you take you with you. And that's a problem. There's enough evil in each of us to account for the evil that goes on in all the world. Uh, Jeremiah put it this way, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we are all fallen. We all from time to time suffer. So, is any one among you suffering? Let him pray. Ah, but here's the thing. Sometimes people don't pray except when they suffer. Uh, it's one minute a day, maybe, according to Barna, except when they suffer. Then all of a sudden they're like hyper spiritual all the time seeking the Lord. It's sort of like going to an ER. Who calls the emergency room just to chat with somebody? <laughs> no, you, you have the conversation and you go to the emergency room if there is an emergency. Uh, according to um, one research group, they said the prayer habits of Americans, here's a little quip from that, some of these prayers, these prayers of the Americans they researched, are born in extremis. That is, when life is bad, they're suffering, they're hurting, there's pain, an extreme situation. Some of these prayers are born in extremis. There are few atheists in cancer wards or unemployment lines. And it goes on to say 90% of Americans that they researched pray for healing. We understand that. We understand that when crisis hits, that people instinctively will turn their voices upward toward heaven and pray to God, asking God for help. In fact, let me just throw this out. Perhaps one of the reasons that we suffer is because when a crisis hits, we talk to God. We just don't talk to God until a crisis hits, and it's, I can kind of picture God going, oh, it's been a while, nice to see you again, glad you could show up from time to time. And that, could it be that God just allows a smattering of pain in our lives from time to time to get our attention and bring us back into communion with Him? Because He knows that's where the secret sauce is when we're connected to Him. But... Most people pray as a last resort instead of a first response. Now let me turn that around. Could it be that if we made prayer our first response, it would never have to be our last resort? We pray because we believe somewhere deep down that God is the source of help and comfort. 
as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he is the Father of mercies. He is the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our tribulations. But something you need to know, and I will try to move along quickly, but you know me by now. So uh, look at the word pray. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now, you might read that little word pray and say, yeah, I'm going to shoot up a prayer like an arrow. Boing. Oh, God, help. Boing. I'm suffering. Please, Lord. Boing. That's not what it means. The word here is in the present tense. It means an ongoing, continual prayer. It's much like what, uh, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. Those are in the present tense. Knock or ask, keep on asking. Seek, keep on seeking. Knock, keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. It's a continual thing. One of my favorite stories in Daniel is in chapter 10. Somebody in the worship team mentioned Daniel chapter 9, how uh, Daniel uh, was praying, or it was actually uh, Taylor um, uh, in the announcements, that uh, Daniel was praying in chapter 9. Well, in chapter 10, he's still praying. And an angel comes and says, Hey, Daniel, the day you started praying, I was sent from heaven to answer your prayer. But the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days until Michael had to kind of get me out of that bind, and I showed up. So here's a guy praying. 21 days later, the angel shows up. What if Daniel would have quit on day 15? He kept on asking, kept on praying, kept on seeking. That's the idea. Anyone among you suffering? Keep it up. Keep praying. Don't stop. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way, prayer pulls the rope down below and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so languidly. Others give only an occasional jerk at the rope, but he who communicates with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continually with all his might. You get the visual picture of the guy doing that? Ding, 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 all day long. Anyone suffering? Let him pray. So pray when you're suffering. Number two, pray when you're smiling. Not everybody is suffering. Some of you, you're doing great. Life is good. He continues, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing Psalms. Now, I think you'll agree that singing psalms is a form of praying. Sing psalms. Sing when life is good. When life is good, praise music should come out of your lips. Being thankful. You know, Judaism and Christianity are singing religions. Not atheism. Atheism is songless. They have nothing to sing about. True story, in the 1800s, there was a very, I was going to say famous, infamous atheist named Robert Ingersoll. He was a lawyer, he was an author, he was a politician, and he was given the name the great agnostic, even though he was an atheist. Well, on his funeral notice was a line in large letters that said, there will be no singing. Can you imagine? We're going to have a funeral for this guy. There will be no singing. Well, let me get it out to the public right now. At my funeral, there will be singing. I hope it's not ding dong, the witch is dead, <laughs> but there will be singing. Singing is so important to Christians. For the last 2,000 years, hundreds of thousands of worship hymns and songs have been written by believers. The words sing, singing, song, songs, and sang are found 225 times in the scriptures. It's not hard to find churches that want to sing. They all do. It's just a natural thing. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. A survey of 1,800 different church congregations. I'm sorry, different people from 24 different congregations. So almost 2,000 people, 24 churches. They kind of came up with the idea that people love to sing because singing brings great comfort, especially if it's a song they remember from an episode in their life. Oh, I love that song. Like, it sort of captured something for me at that time. And here you are suffering or struggling or happy about something, and you, you were reminded of it because of the song. Songs bring great comfort. And yet, also in this little survey, they said, even though, so people are saying, we love to sing. It brings great comfort, even though 50% say they don't sing very well. So they admit, I don't sing well, but I love to sing. But I don't sing very well. But I love to sing, I just don't sing very well. But that's okay, isn't it? Because we're not auditioning for a choir. We're, God is conditioning us for the future. Start singing now, because you're going to be doing a lot of it in heaven. Notice, though, that James never says anything about how we should sing. He says, are you cheerful? Sing. He didn't, he didn't say, sing with a perfect vibrato, uh, with, um, um, with a one, three, five harmony. Sing beautifully. He didn't say that. He just says, sing. Now, there are scriptures that do qualify and tell us how to sing, but you'll be happy to know they too don't say, has to be good, has to be perfect, has to be on key. It's nice if it is, by the way. It's helpful. <laughs> it just says, make a joyful noise. Amen. Or shout joyfully to the Lord. Anybody can do that. We can all pull that off. So the question is not, do I have a voice? The question is, do I have a song? Has God put a song in my heart? Not do I have a beautiful voice to express it, I can make a joyful noise, but do I have a song? So this is very natural for the Christian. You're cheerful, sing. Interesting that bars have a thing called happy hour. This is happy hour. Right now, we're in it. Sundays, Saturdays, Wednesdays, we get together, we sing. Happy hour, happy hour. But he, uh, he does ask a question. I didn't even go over that yet. Is anyone cheerful? Now, you might read that and go, well, whew, that, that's not me. And this is why I don't sing at church, because I'm not cheerful. Not, I don't mean generally, but maybe you're going through a very difficult time. And because you're going through a difficult time, it's just not in you. You're not feeling it. And so you might say, you know, I'm kind of exempted from this because I'm not cheerful. But here's what the word cheerful means. It means to be well in your soul. Not emotionally or, or outwardly, but the well-being of the soul. Let me ask you, Christian, saved by God's grace, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, is it well with your soul? It is well with your soul because of what he has done for you and the imputed righteousness of Christ to you. So are you in that condition? Yes. Then let us sing. Let us sing. You see, when it is well with your soul, your soul will well up with praise. The Christian is not joyful because of what is going on outside of him, but what is going on inside of him. There's an inner world, and if it is controlled by God, it will bring joy in the midst of chaos. Case in point, Paul and Silas were beaten with rods, thrown in a jail in Philippi, and the Bible strangely enough says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang hymns to God, and they heard it. One of the greatest cures of discouragement is to sing to God who rules over everything even when I don't understand what he is doing. And by the way, there are physical benefits to singing. Did you know that? It'll, it will lower your blood pressure. You'll get better lung capacity, improved posture, toned facial muscles. 
When you sing, this article says, you are controlling and working your facial muscles. This acts as a kind of workout for them and helps your face look more toned and younger. <laughs> Forget all those creams you spend hundreds of dollars on. Start singing. Get a workout for your face. Now, I'm not suggesting that you just worship God so you look younger, but <laughs> heck, if it works. Proverbs says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. So pray when you're suffering. Pray when you're smiling. Third, pray when you're sick. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now let me just say, this is one of the most disputed verses in the entire New Testament. And uh, I'm not going to get into the weeds too much on this. I just want to give you some explanation of it. I'll tell you what this is not. James is not giving a blanket formula for healing the sick. And the formula would be elders plus anointing oil plus faith equals always healed. It's not what he is saying. In fact, Many scholars don't even think James is speaking about being physically sick at all, but rather being spiritually sick. Because the word here for sick literally means weak or weary. Weak or weary. And sometimes in the Bible, it's a word that refers to physical sickness. More often than not, it refers to emotional sickness. So, it could be that James is simply describing those who are weak and weary because they have suffered so much. They have been suffering. They have been persecuted. They have been outliers in their society, and because of that, they are weak and weary, or they are emotionally and spiritually sick. Something else you should know. It says, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord literally means to rub him down with oil. Um, think of a massage. Not that that's what they were doing, but the idea is it wasn't for ceremonial purposes. Uh, it was more for medicinal purposes. He is not describing an anointing ritual as a means of divine healing, but the common practice often used by physicians to rub oil on the skin to refresh or to soothe or to honor. Um, it is used of the woman in Luke chapter 17 who poured oil on the feet of Jesus. Jesus said, she's anointing me for my burial. Jesus said, when you fast, don't look like you're fasting, but rather anoint your head and wash your face. Or the good Samaritan who saw the guy who was beat up on the side of the road, and he applied to his body oil and wine to help the man's wounds. So in other words, somebody who was weak and weary of life should come to the leadership of the church where they get refreshed, encouraged in those days because physicians weren't readily available. They should get rubbed with oil and prayed for. Now, not everybody agrees with that. They don't like that interpretation, even though that seems to really fit historically. And um, without, again, going down a rabbit hole or trying to get into the weeds, let me just say this. God can and does heal. Without getting into all the interpretation of... God can and does heal. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe God still can and he still does heal people. Sometimes he chooses to heal people through natural processes. Did you know your body has built in natural things that happen when you get cut, when you get hurt, to help naturally heal you? Sometimes he uses medicine, doctors, hospitals. Sometimes he heals miraculously. And sometimes he doesn't heal at all. He says no. But it's an answer to prayer nonetheless. You see, if it was always God's will to always heal, no one would ever die. 
I've prayed for people, and I've seen them healed legitimately, miraculously, and I have somewhat of a medical background. I had enough sense to know this is a miracle. That person was miraculously healed in front of my eyes. I prayed for other people, and I've watched them die. Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh. He said, I prayed to God three times. This is Paul. This is the apostle. I prayed three times. God finally answered me and basically said, "Uh uh-uh. My grace is all you need. My strength will be manifest in your weaknesses. I'm going to keep you weak so that you'll always lean on my strength. That was Paul's answer. But when we're sick, we should be praying. We should be asking. We should be knocking. We should be seeking. We should present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So pray when you're suffering. Pray when you're smiling. Pray when you're sick. Fourth, pray when you sin. Now, I I need to explain that very quickly. I don't mean pray during your sin. Like, you know, I'm going to go over here and sin, then I'm going to balance it out and shoot up a prayer while I'm doing it balance things out. I mean, once you know that you have sinned, you should pray. The prayer of faith, verse 15, will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins or trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Now, James here seems to indicate a sickness that is a result of sin in a person's life, a sinful circumstance. So the believer is being disciplined by God. Here's some man who has committed some sin. He is now sick. He now realizes that God is chastening him. So he confesses his sin to God. He then finds the elders of the church, confesses his sin to them also. They pray, rub him with oil, and God answers that prayer. It's a promise in its context that When sickness is the result of some sin, and that sin is confessed and forsaken, that healing will take place. Of course, we should always pray when we know we've committed some act of sin, something displeasing to the Lord. It's called confession, right? Confession. It's also called repentance. Once you know and you identify it and you confess it, then you, by God's grace, turn away from it. Confession, repentance. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, that's a prayer. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the reason we confess and the reason we repent when we know we've done anything that displeases the Lord, is because it is that sin that hinders the effectiveness of our prayers. God's hand is not short that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. Your sins have separated you and your God. So you want to remove the roadblock? Confess the sin. Turn from it. So pray when you're suffering. Pray when you're smiling. Pray when... You're sick. Pray when you sin. And then fifth and finally, pray for the saints. Pray for other people. Not just yourself. Now turn your focus and pray for other people. Verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another. And here it is, here it is. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Healed physically, healed emotionally, healed spiritually. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man gets a lot done or avails much. Or I love the old King James, availeth much. Now this is called intercession. When I pray for other people, this is called intercession. It's a very specific category of prayer. I will say this. Every other form of prayer that I've mentioned so far under these conditions that I've described them are much, much easier than this one. Intercession is much harder. And let me explain that. Praying when I am suffering, pretty easy. Easy to do. Because I'm praying for myself. I'm suffering. God, don't you see me? 
God, won't you heal me? I'm praying for myself. I'm aware of what I lack. I'm aware of what I need, or I think I'm aware of what I need. God knows what I need, but I'm suffering. Pretty easy to pray. When it comes to worship, singing, when life is good, that's easy. Life is good. Easy to sing, whistle. God is awesome. Singing to him takes no effort whatsoever for me. Confession of my sin is easy because I know I need forgiveness. I want the roadblock taken away. I want fellowship restored. Ah, but intercession, much harder because now I'm not focused on myself. Now I'm not even focused on God. Now I'm focused on you, and, I, and, and I'm not as much invested in your situation as my situation. So to pray for you and your needs is, is much harder. In fact, it is labor. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul speaks of Epaphras, and he says to the church, he is laboring fervently for you in prayer. Laboring fervently fervently for you in prayer. I'll be honest with you. When I, when I pray for others, I get distracted very easily. So I, I need to do something about that. So let me just tell you a little hack, a little spiritual hack. This is just me. This is what I've done. Because I know this about myself, if I sit down and just start praying for you, I'll just start thinking of something or I'll want to get on my phone or something. All those distractions we all face. So what I do is every morning my dog makes me get up early and walk her. And, I mean, it's 6 o'clock, she's on my, in my face, like, come on. So I get up, and I take my phone, and on the phone is a Calvary app, and there's a little section called prayer, and all of your prayer requests get filtered there. So, because walking my dog is a pretty mundane activity, and it does not require much thought for me, I can walk along, but I can have this little thing and go through all the prayers, and I can labor in prayer while I'm walking my dog. I found that to be a very helpful thing. You may want to try it. If not, buy a dog. It might in increase your prayer life somewhat. When I'm interceding for people, uh, I discover that prayer is a battle. I told you about distractions and disturbances. Just try this sometime. Sit down and start praying for other people and see if your phone doesn't ring, if somebody doesn't knock at your front door, if somebody doesn't try to text you a message or uh, you hear a bing email on the computer, and why is that? Why, is, why when you pray do you get distracted? I'm just letting the question linger a minute before I answer it. Here's why. Because when you pray, you just brought a gun to a knife fight. Get the picture? A knife fight. Satan just wants you to hold on to that knife. I'll fight you, devil. I'll rebuke you. I'll talk to you. Well, you know, really? Just pull out the big gun. You're in a knife fight. Pull out a gun. I'm not saying that you should go home and pull out a gun. You, you understand, please, the context of this illustration. You just called on the God of heaven and earth. That's the big gun. You ask God to get involved in the battle instead of fighting it on your own. That's the deciding factor. Samuel Chaddock, I'll put this little great saying up. Samuel Chaddock said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Well, I know so much about the Greek, and remember, who, he didn't care. He would, you know. <laughs> but when you pray, you just brought a gun to a knife fight. Get out the big gun. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. So if there is a God in heaven... And if that God in heaven invites us to call on him, and he does, Jeremiah 33, 3, and if that God in heaven who invites us to call on him promises us 
that he will act in some fashion when we call on him, why are we not doing that? And could that be the reason that some of us lack power? Years ago, there was a missionary, true story. Herbert Jackson was a missionary to India. He was given a car while he was there. The only problem with the car, he put the key in, turned the ignition. Uh, the car would go on, but the ignition wouldn't start the car. So uh, it had to be pushed. And then he put it in second gear. You guys have ever done that? You step off the clutch, it starts going. So he, that's how he, for two years he did that. So he lived by a school. He would go to the school in the morning if he had to do errands, get a bunch of kids out of class to push the car, get them started. Then he'd do his errands, and he'd always park on a hill so he could roll it downward or keep the engine running. He did this for two years. He got sick. He had to go back home. A new young missionary came to replace him. He gave him the keys to the car, told him how the car works. The young missionary, the new guy, opened the hood of the car and said, I think I see your problem. It's just a loose cable. He connected it, sure enough, turned it over. Vroom, the engine roared. Now think of that. Herbert Jackson lived for two years with a fixable problem that was never resolved. Power was there the whole time. It was a loose connection that kept him from enjoying the power. Do you have a loose connection that's keeping you out of touch with the power of God? Power is there. You've got a fixable problem. But instead, you're living your life. Kids, come on here, push the car. People spend 17 hours every week managing email. How much time do we spend managing knee mail? Knee mail. You know the song. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Kids, let's push the car. All because we do not carry everything. Everything. Everything to God in prayer. Well, Father, we want to close with prayer. We have just read one of the seminal passages in the entire New Testament on prayer for various reasons in its various forms. Many of these we can relate with. Probably all of them we can relate with. Some here are suffering. Others are not. Some are sick. Others are not. From time to time, all of us sin. All of us know people who need help. These things are relevant for our lives. Now, Lord, we want to close with the prayer of the disciples to the Lord Jesus, who said, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. I'm convinced, Lord, they knew how to pray. They grew up in Jewish homes. They knew all the prayers. They knew how to do it. But the request was, show us to do it. Help us do it. Teach us to be praying. We pray that you would do that for us, that we might be connected to the living God, taking territory that the enemy has taken in people's lives, in our city, Knowing, Lord, we know that the purpose of prayer is not to get our will done in heaven, but to get your will accomplished on the earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us stay connected and enjoy the power. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this teaching has impacted you. Share your story with us. Email my story at calvarynm.church. 
And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church/give.